everybody, I am Abby Elizabeth and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. And I want to talk to you today, my sisters, about raising up a godly seed and how it is that we train up our children. You see, even if you're not a parent and you're maybe you're a grandmother, maybe you're an aunt, maybe you're a mother, maybe you have children that your husband has with him from a previous relationship. All of these situations for a woman are very, very important. It's a huge part of what a woman is called to do. When I've spoken before that men and women are different and that women are made to be a suitable servant to their husband, one of the most important ways in which a woman is a servant unto her husband is that she trains the children. The children are with her most of the time, especially in the early years. And this is an important part of what it means to be a Christian woman, how it is that we do this. But sadly, these days, most of us were not raised up in a godly family ourselves. We were raised up instead of the, the psychiatric institutions that are known as the public school system. We don't know anything about God's principles for raising children. And for that reason, I'm going to speak to you about it today and go over some basic but very important principles. And again, this is important if you're a mother, if you're an aunt, if you're a grandmother, even if you have children near unto you, neighbor's children. You want to know what your role is as a godly woman. Glory be to God. Now, the first thing I would say, let's begin in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse, pardon me, pardon me, in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word today. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. There are a lot of people who misinterpret this scripture in a very wicked way. And they, they don't mean to. They're trying to do the right thing, but they misunderstand it. This scripture doesn't mean that we beat our children for no reason or that we beat them all the time. It means that we chasten our children the way God chastens us. And one of the most important things in the role of a woman is to be a picture of the bride of Christ. And children, new Christians, need to learn about the mercy and truth of God and the righteousness of God. And so God doesn't beat us up the first time we do something wrong. He instructs us in his word. He lets us know in his word what he expects. And the consequences for our failure to conform ourselves to his word are measured and appropriate to the degree to which we understood that what we were doing was wrong. God is not cruel. We read in, about this in Hebrews chapter 12. So let's turn there in Hebrews chapter 12. And let's begin here in verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So here we can see the same situation, that God chastens his children. And we who are parents chasten our children. And we chasten our children in the way that we would want God to chasten us, or the way that we have experienced him chasing up us, chastening us. Pardon me. So in verse 6 again, we read, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You see, every single Christian is chastened of God. There is nobody who comes into the body of Christ who knows how to be a saint the minute they're baptized. The truth of the matter is, is that we all end up having to learn different ways than what we walked before. 
and sometimes that involves suffering the consequences of not doing what is right. However, sometimes we don't know what is right. We're not familiar with the word of God yet. So God doesn't treat a young baby Christian who doesn't know the word yet the same way as he might treat someone who has been walking with him for a while and knows what the word says. And the same is true of us as parents. If a child does something when they're two years old that we told them not to do, it's not the same thing as a seven-year-old who does such a thing, who knows better, or a 15-year-old. So we want to exercise mercy with our children and understand that if they don't know something, it's on us, that they need to know from us what is right and what is wrong. Furthermore, as a Christian, we know that the Word of God is very explicit about what God expects. We know what the rules are, and we know what the consequences are. And the same thing should be true of our children. When we have young children, we should have simple rules. We don't expect a two-year-old to know the things and adhere to the rules that a 10-year-old would adhere to. So in the beginning, when we first have children, we make the rules simple. Things like, if you make a mess, clean it up. Treating the parents with respect. Saying please and thank you. That kind of thing. Simple rules. And when they don't do it immediately, we don't beat them up. We simply remind them because they're young. The, way, the same way, pardon me, the same way that God reminds us when we're young. So let's read on a little bit further here in verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. And shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? You see, parents correct their children, and the first way that they correct their children is verbally just the way we, as a young Christian, are corrected in the Word. So when we're a new Christian, we read the Word of God and we're convicted. We see that we're not anything like what God expects, and we try to become that. And when we're making an effort, God sees that, and He guides us gently. However, if we're rebellious and we don't want to do what He says, then gradually and over time, increasingly, the consequences will get more severe. And the best way to discipline a child is to allow them to feel natural consequences. For example, if you take a five-year-old into a store, and when you get out of the store, you discover that they have a candy bar in their pocket. You don't cover it up for them. You don't take the consequence for them. Instead, you take the child and the candy back into the store and you have the child apologize and return it. And then you pay for it. And then you exact some kind of payment from your child when you get home. Maybe a favorite toy will be taken away for the day. Or maybe the picnic you were going to go on won't happen. It depends on the severity of the crime. But the punishment with God always fits the crime. And it should with us also as parents. So we want to be... We want to be faithful to our children the same way God is faithful to us. If God didn't tell us the kind of things were, that were going to land us in the lake of fire, then we would likely land in the lake of fire. It's our responsibility, therefore, as parents, to educate our children about the difference between right and wrong. Now, in later videos, I'm going to go over differences in children's gender, their sex, and how we raise them, the things that we do that are different for boys than they are for girls. But today I'm just going over some basic principles. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. There are people these days, and, and you know, there's so much foolishness in the world. 
who think that children should never suffer a consequence, they should never be spanked, they shouldn't even be expected to do anything around the house or contribute to the family's well-being in any way, that somehow childhood means, means a complete freedom from responsibility and that all children have to have is play, play, play. And this is false. It's foolishness. People used to know that one of the main reasons to have children was to have those children be part of the labor that took place in the household. When we are a mother, we don't leave our children off in the other room while we do all the cooking and cleaning. Rather, they should be with us and doing these things with us. If we're teaching our children to count, for example, we might we might be with them and count the vegetables that we're about to put into the sauce. If we're teaching our children about things like responsibility and contributing. Now, responsibility and contributing, by the way, has to do with self-respect. When a child does what is right, when they help out, even if it's just a little bit, even if they're helping isn't really helping, as a mother, we would encourage that. We would praise the child for wanting to contribute rather than praising the child for things like being cute or being pretty or being smart. You see, these days, people educate their children to have something called self-esteem, which is liking themselves no matter what. But in the old times, in, in the biblical way, children were taught to have self-respect. And when they did wrong, they were punished, they were chastened. And when they did right, they were praised. These days, children are praised no matter what they do. And they're allowed to run around and do whatever they want, make as much noise as they want, make as much of a mess as they want, while mama runs around behind them with a mop. And that is wrong. We don't want to ch train up our children to, to think that they're entitled to act that way. And that when we are training our children, one important thing we want to keep in mind is that if we start to not like being around them, that means they need correction. We don't want to raise up our children to behave in ways that make us uncomfortable or other people uncomfortable. We want to teach them the difference between right and wrong and the difference between kindness and cruelty. And the first way we treat that teach our children, pardon me, the first way we teach our children the difference between kindness and cruelty is to be kind ourselves and not cruel. So we don't expect our children to know something before we've taught it to them. And we don't necessarily expect them to remember it the first time we tell them. Just as God has been long-suffering and patient with us, we want to be long-suffering and patient with our children, training up our children in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Part of what this means then is that things like fun and cheat treats and having pleasurable things or rewards should be connected to contributing and to good behavior. It should be related to the lesson that the child is learning. So if you're treating, treat, treat, pardon me, I need to slow down. If you're teaching a child that they should be considerate of their little brother, that their little brother doesn't know as much as they do, when they start to understand and try to help their little brother rather than, than get mad at their little brother, then we would reward that. We would say something good about it. We would give them a hug and encouragement. One of the most important parts about being a good parent is to be paying attention to how our child is doing and what they're learning and not just the things that the education system tells us as homeschool parents they need to learn. More important than that are the, the, the things that people used to value, things like conduct, manners, respect, self-discipline, con contributing to the family, repentance when do having done wrong. And the way that children learn this isn't by whacking them across the back the first time they make a mistake. 
It's made by speaking to them. And we speak to God about the things we're concerned about because we trust him. He knows he, we know he's fair to us. We want to create the same, same condition in our children where they will come to us with their concerns. We want to make sure we're listening when they come to us. So when a little child comes to us and says something like, Mommy, I don't know what to do. The, the other child over there just grabbed something out of my hands when I was playing with it. That then we listen to that problem. And when we listen to it and we deal with it fairly, the way God deals fairly with us, he shows us the way we should go. And the way he does it, of course, is in his word. When we treat our children fairly, then they will come to us with their problems. And then when they get older and things happen, like the kid across the street offered them marijuana, they're going to come to us with that rather than than be off on their own choosing things that are dangerous. We can see this in the scripture when we go to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 15. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So the rod and reproof, the rod and reproof. So we don't allow our children to do whatever they want. We don't allow them to make the whole family revolve around their chaos either. We conduct ourselves with, with order and with godliness, and we expect our children to be with us and learn our order from us as they partake of it with us. So, for example... We get up in the morning and we've got, we've got a baby, we've got a, a two-year-old, and we've got a five-year-old. And it's time for breakfast. Well, the baby is going to sit in the high chair and, and play with something while we start to get breakfast ready. The three-year-old might set the table and put the plates and the silverware out for the family. And the five-year-old, did I say five-year-old or six-year-old? Well, at any rate, the next oldest child we do things like like um, set out the food um, and, and, and help mama prepare things. Maybe pour the blueberries into the batter for the blueberry muffins. You see, when we're doing this, the children feel important. They feel like they're necessary. And they feel, they feel like mommy needs their help, which, by the way, you do. If you have three children, you need the older children to help. And they should be helping. And the way that you teach them, of course, is with supervising them and instructing them in the thing that they're learning. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Now, for a moment now, I just want to talk about the, the, um, the festival that people call the Christmas festival, which is the Christ Mass, and what we do about this sort of thing. We tell our children the truth about this, and it's so very important to tell them the truth, even if other family members are lying to them about it. And the reason why is this. A child very easily has faith. When Jesus Christ said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And when he said, Unless you receive the kingdom like a little child, you shall in no ways enter in. The reason he said that is because a child has an innocent and pure faith, a natural inclination to believe in God. And when people lie to them, their parents lie to them and tell them they're such a being as Santa Claus. And they lie to them about reindeer and leaving cookies out and chimneys and stockings and st stuff like this. That when parents lie to their children about that, or they allow other people to lie to their children about that, what happens then is when the children finds out that there is no such being as Santa Claus, something inside their heart breaks. We don't want to lie to our children, my sisters. We want to always be careful to tell them the truth, and tell them the truth in a way that they can handle it. 
So children who have been told a lie about the Christ Mass Festival and the presents and all that other fairy tale nonsense become prepared at a very young age to believe theology. You see, theology is the twisting of scripture in order to call evil good, to call right wrong. When people make Jesus Christ about something that is pagan and selfish and greedy and covetous and shallow, when, when people make Jesus Christ about those things and then that child finds out that they were lied to, that can ruin them for a very long time about the truth of Jesus Christ. They will feel betrayed and they will never trust you quite the same way again either because that precious thing inside of them, their faith, was destroyed by a lie. A popular lie, but it's still a lie. Now, if other people lie to our children, if we've told them the truth, of course, that's the best defense. And the, th the same thing is true of us. The best defense against deception is to know the truth, and that is found in the Word of God. Finally, we want to read the Word of God in the presence of our children. We want to read the Word of God all the time as Christians. We abide in the Word of God. And we don't give them special books called Bible stories. We don't do that because you know what that is? That's like dumbing them down and making them ready to receive things like the NIV and the ESV. No, no, we don't read them Bible stories at bedtime. We read them from the, the Bible stories from the Bible. And when we do that, they will naturally learn the true English that is in the Holy King James Bible. When our children ask us questions about what is in the Word of God, we can answer them. And if we don't know the answer, of course, we could ask our husband before we answer it. Or we could say to the child, well, we'll have to ask Daddy when he gets back from work. But we don't give our children fairy tales and we don't give them corrupt translations of the Word of God. We don't let them watch cartoons about David and Goliath either. We shouldn't even have a television in our house. What we should do is go about the business of the household as a godly woman. Cleaning the house, preparing the food, tending the garden, caring for the young babies and so forth. We do those things. And the children should be with us, doing that with us. And we should let them try to help us. There should never be a condition in a godly home where a child doesn't know how to pick up their own toys or at least help mommy do it. We don't want to train our children to expect that other people clean up after them or that they're entitled to be in frivolity and foolishness while the adults do all the work. Because the problem with that is is that then that child doesn't know the value of being part of a family, a valuable part of a family. A child's questions should be respected. You know, about the age of three years old, children commonly enter a phase where everything that they hear and everything that they see is, is countered with the question, why? Why this? Why that? Why is the sky blue, mommy? Why, why is that lady fat? Why this? Why that? You see? And so we, when we're answering the child's questions, which we would respect and not dismiss and not, not ignore, like they're bothering us, rather, we would answer them with wisdom and grace. So if they say, why is that lady fat? We'd say, my child, it's not nice to say that in front of people. If you say that, that woman's going to feel bad, right? How would you like it if someone said, how come you, you know, have this or that about how you look, right? So we say that quietly to the child and we get down at eye level with them and we make contact with them and let them know. And then the child who is being brought up this way will say, oh, I'm sorry, I, mommy, I see. You see, if we want our children to be kind, we have to teach them to be kind. If we want them to be respectful, we want to teach them to be respectful. And 
one way that's very important to do that is we don't disrespect our children. So we don't tell them to shut up. We don't bash them over the head the minute they make a mistake because that's not respectful. What we do is we teach them, we tell them. And then if they're rebellious, then of course we chasten them. And we don't chasten them with anger. If we have to spank a child, we do so to exact justice. Justice. So a child that just bopped another child over the head with a toy truck needs to have a, a physical consequence that's painful because that's what they did. And that situation, that's a good consequence because they just did something that could have harmed physically another child. And they should have some physical pain as well as instruction about that. So first the spanking and then the explanation is what's necessary. And the explanation should include that hurt that other child. And that's wrong. It's wrong to do that. And when the child understands, then you give them the hug. Then you encourage them. Once they've repented, you do unto them as you would want your Heavenly Father to do unto you, which is to say, I'm glad that you learned the lesson. Okay, let me give you a hug. Now we'll move on. And then you don't bring it up again. This is the way God treats us. And this is the way we should raise our children, my sisters, with mercy and truth. With mercy and with truth. We explain why we do things to children. We, we tell them why we're doing the things that we do. If they ask a mother, for example, why she wears a veil and why other ladies don't, we explain it to them. When our children want to know why it is that, that they should respect their father when he comes home from work and not be running around the house making all kinds of noise. You see, if they ask us to explain why, we should, but we should always have the expectation there first. So we tell them the right thing if they want to know why we explain it. We tell them the wrong thing and if they want to know why we explain it. And we, along with that, they should know the very clear and reasonable consequences that exist. So they should know that if they disobey mommy, there's going to be a consequence. It will be fair. It won't be done with anger, but there will be a consequence. So if mommy says, I don't want you to touch those cookies, until after dinner and then she goes out in the garden to pick something for the, the meal and comes back in there's crumbs all around the child's face that child should face a consequence for that and it shouldn't be above and beyond what the the infraction was when we love our children though we do not spare consequences we don't spare the rod because if we do that's the same thing as hating our children Glory be to God. When we are respecting our husband and our parents, we would teach our children by our example how to respect our husband and our parents. When we refer to our husband as sir or lord in front of our children, then they will know to do so also. And they should call their father sir. They should say yes sir, no sir. When we are referring to to, to things with our parents where there's difficulties, maybe our parents believe in the Christ Mass Festival, they would see our example and how we conduct ourselves, such as that we would say, I'm sorry, Mom, I don't partake of that. It's something that's worshiping other gods. I obey the Bible. And then the children learn that. And then when they're confronted with situations like that, they know what to do because they saw us do it. So that's the final thing. The best way to teach a child is not only with your words and the word of God. It's with your example. So you don't expect children to do what you don't do. You don't expect them to understand things that you don't understand. So when you don't know something, what do you do? Well, you hope in the word of God to see what God has to say. And you pray about it. 
And you would do the same thing with your children. When they have done something that displeases you, you can explain to them why from God's word, such as, thou shalt not steal. You see, a child will naturally conform themselves to the word of God if they're given the word of God young. And a godly mother shares the word of God with her children in, in the way that she reads it and the way that she abides in it. So she might get up in the morning and open the scripture and read, spend some time reading for herself. And the child might come up in her lap. They just got out of bed and they might climb up in her lap. And she can read the word of God to that child. There is nothing ever that should tell you that your child needs something to do while you're doing that. That your child should be playing while you work. And you can make word work fun. You can make the word delightful. Because those two things are true anyway. Meaningful work and the word of God are indeed our delight as a Christian. And when we're abiding in the word of God and doing what it says and speaking the word to our children, they will do so also. Glory be to God. So I hope this message has been edifying for you, my sisters, and I remain here for you. Feel free to email me or to comment in the comment section below. May the word of the Lord go forth today and edify many in Jesus' precious name. Amen.